degrees that you can get, or emphasis you can get. So what were the emphasis, the emphases of a hospitality degree? There was event planning, there was hotel management, and there was restaurant management. It was what you had, but you kind of fell into different sectors. And then PGA was also included in the hospitality program, which I'm not quite sure why, but they were. The um, golfers? Yeah, the golfers. Okay. Well, I, I know why. Because a lot of times the pro manages both the golf club and, like, the shop, but they mm -hmm. also manage the restaurant. Yeah. So, like, the beverages and the food that are out on the course and stuff are a part of their sales. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the classes were management, but they were, I mean, you had food and beverage. You had, we had catering. We had event, cord, like, event planning, different sectors. And then we did have hotel we had a hotel class, yeah. And we did tour different hotels. And then we just discussed, you know, the different sectors of hospitality. And then you, we didn't have anything specifically for tourism or travel, but that kind of falls in all categories. Because you're, if you're going to be a tourism coordinator, then you have to be able to coordinate, you know, travel, restaurants, hotels, and kind of be like a concierge, too, where you do activities and that sort of stuff. And find them toothbrushes. Right. Right. I'm going to welcome you all to the Hospitality Authority Podcast. I'm Kurt Wissenberg. I'm here with Miley Elak Bader, Michaela Olson, and new to the podcast, Chef, Chef John, John Anderson. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. Say, say, hey, John. Hey, John. <laughs> and I do. He's going to do that. I did too. So I just lobbed up a, a softball, and he knocked it out of the park. I think so he's going to do just fine. We're just sitting here in the here in the office, and we're talking about the hospitality industry as a career. And then Miley just plugged the microphone into her phone and hit record. And so we just started the podcast. Yeah, and we have 17% battery. Because oh, so apparently... Does that mean we have to talk faster? <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Not only do I not know where my phone case is, but I also did not plug my phone in. Well, we'll just go till it dies and that'll be it. There you go. Um, so we have two people in here who are classically and formally trained in the hospitality industry. Correct? That's correct. <laughs> yeah. And Michaela, your degree is? I have a degree in hospitality, restaurant, tourism management with an emphasis in event planning and leadership. From? University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Go Big Red. Yes. And Chef John? I have, first off, a, let's see, how do I say this properly? I am a classically trained professional chef. Yes. From Le Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts. And I have a bachelor's from the same college in restaurant and hospitality management. So the only differences between Michaela's and mine is mine is the first half was solely on how to prepare food. And the second half was how to run a restaurant. And there were slight touches on resorts and uh, cruise ships. But it was all math and numbers as far as, you know. To say, I have to tell you, we were working on a graduation contract the other day, and I sent kitchen manager John mm -hmm. a message and asked if him and Chef we have, John. We have 17 Johns who work here, <laughs> so it gets confusing. And 96 bathrooms. Right. <laughs> so anyway, we were discussing a contract, and a graduate wanted a pasta bar. And when you're planning graduation buffets, you really want to do it as cost-effectively as possible because part of the reason parents come here is because they don't have to clean their house, they don't have to prepare the food, they don't have to clean the food, and they can leave the mess to us. Amen. And we're so happy to do that for them. We try really hard to make it cost-effective, and I shot just a text message to kitchen manager John and said, hey, can you and Chef John price out this? And I said, I want it, you know, penne pasta, a meat sauce, a white sauce, breadsticks, Parmesan cheese, and beverages. And him and the two Johns, John Squared, got together and pumped out the math in a matter of really brief time. And when Chef John handed me the sheet, it had the price per serving of pasta, meat sauce, Alfredo, breadsticks, Parmesan cheese, plus the cutlery and the labor for the overall total. He likes math. That's good, but I was going to point out another difference between your your colleges was the football team. Because I don't know, <laughs> the Cordon Bleu, do you have a mascot? or No, not 
No, I would, it I would used call to be a no, chef no. hat. It used to be a white chef hat. Remember that? Like it'd be yes, College yes, of La Cor- yes. It'd be mm-hmm. La Cordon Bleu. I would call them the La Cordon Bleu Devils. <laughs> <laughs> or chickens. No. Oh. <laughs> It could be a chicken and a pig. Isn't it Delaware? Is it the blue hens or something? Delaware I don't know. State. Mm. Could be. For a later podcast. <laughs> Oddly enough, through all my college in Le Cordon Bleu, one thing they did not teach me how to cook was chicken cordon bleu. Get out. Okay, so chicken cordon bleu is where you stuff you stuff a chicken with a pig and then you wrap it in breading and then well, there's you cheese make it. too, right? Oh, and you put some cheese in there, so you it. So chicken cordon bleu is what you get when you cross a cow, a pig, and a chicken. But it's different than a turducken. Yes. <laughs> I am obsessed with turduckens. That is a turkey which has inside of it a duck, which is inside the duck a chicken. All are deboned. Yes, and then there's stuffing inside the chicken. Chicken mm-hmm. stuffed in a duck, stuffed in a turkey. Now, I've seen it the next step where they stuff that into a pig. <clears throat> was that I don't know what you call it, but I mean, where does it end, really? <laughs> An elephant. Yeah. And, and who can do that? Who has the time? Think of the pit you'd have to dig. Yeah, really. Challenge accepted. Challenge. <laughs> Chef John's going to be scouring the where can, is our, it? can our vendors get elephant meat? I don't think so. I'm fairly certain they're an endangered animal. Yeah, there's a ban on importation. So we'd yeah. Have to, we'd have to raise okay. one from a pup or whatever they are. Uh, they're a calf, aren't they? I don't know. For yeah, sure. they're calf. Yeah. Uh, Let's stop talking about eating elephants. I'm sorry I went down that road. I just thought of Dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I can. <laughs> um, I'm not formally trained in the hospitality industry, but I've learned quite a bit since I've been here. Basically, it's just do what your mother would want you to do and be nice to people. Treat others the way you want to be treated? Well, yeah. But the thing is, I treat people better than I expect <laughs> I to be treated. You know what I'm saying? I, well, I do, too. And I, I still have the view that the customer is always right. They're not. See, and uh, I go back and forth on that. They're not always right. They're not, but... The customer is number one. Right. But they're not always right. That's a good way to put it. I like that. And you always try to find, when you say no, you always try to find a way to say yes. Yeah, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, like, I guess not always right, but that you have to treat them as if their opinion or whatever matters. They may not be right in what they're saying. You still have to value them and put them first, like John said. I mean, the hospitality... Customers Mm. determine a lot in the hospitality business. Word of mouth is huge. The hospitality is a business, 100%. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's a for-profit business. I didn't go to culinary school to go back home and cook. It's a business degree. Mm-hmm. Now, the customer is your paycheck, not to put a finer point on it. Mm-hmm. That is your paycheck. You're not going to disrespect your paycheck. You're not going to treat your paycheck badly. That's kind of the nuts and bolts, very blunt and to the point. So the customer is always number one. Mm -hmm. But if they want the entire restaurant for free, you have to say no because you would not make a profit. But you make an accommodation somehow. You make make some sort of something work for them. You make every reasonable effort Mm -hmm. to make them happy and leave happy because if they leave happy, they come back. I think the other thing about that is I've learned a lot of times when a client is frustrated, it really has nothing to do with you or what you're doing or the service that I you're get rendering. That too. Get that a too. lot of times you have no idea what they've walked in with. You have no idea the baggage you're carrying. And more often than not, they want to be heard. <clears throat> also, the thing, one of the main things about the hospitality industry, which is really hard, is that you have to take your ego out of the situation. Because you have to be able to see the situation from all perspectives and understand where potentially the client is coming from and either reason with them or help them out however you can. But then you also have to see your side of it and see kind of all aspects of the situation and be able to fix it somehow. But you can't let your ego affect like, if they're saying something that's making you mad, you have to try really hard to not take it personally. 
you have to, like, you know, you have to not let it soak into your skin whatsoever. I mean, tough skin is a really big part of the hospitality <clears throat> industry as well. Well, I think a lot of people don't understand that, by and large, the entire root of hospitality is servant, servant. Service. Like, ser service. Like you, you are a servant-minded person, though, and a service-minded person. That's hundred. And those are two very different things. Service-minded means we know that no matter what, we're going to make sure you get something. When you add servant-minded in there, you understand that you were doing this in deference, and you're doing this because you're trying to make sure that there's a better good out of it, and that you're giving them. You understand where your place is in that relationship, uh, and I and I think it's really important. And, and that's probably one of the things like I really love when we look at students and we talk with students. There's a lot to be said about students who get jobs in restaurants, whether it's fast food. I think it's even better when they have to wait tables and earn tips, <coughs> or if they've been a guest attendant, or you know where service, servanthood, and servicehood is all a part of that. And their it's customers in, face to face. With yeah, them. yeah, and it, it 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 always it's really interesting how they once you've had that experience when you go into another place and you're in the recipient where you're the buyer and that relationship and understanding and appreciation comes from. <clears throat> I find I can be a lot more patient about a lot of things because I understand that the waitress isn't bringing me my food fast, but that's probably not her fault. Right. The best, yeah. the best yeah. tippers probably were in the service industry at some point. Yes, so absolutely. My sister, my sister in law has a degree in culinary arts and she used to manage a restaurant. And I re remember them, my brother and her telling me numerous stories where they'd go to a restaurant and my brother would get super annoyed because, you know, he didn't bring their drinks on time or like there was some sort of error happening. And my sister in law would always, always defend the server. And say, you know, you don't know what's going on in the back of the kitchen. You have no idea if somebody didn't show up to work and she's covering two sections. You don't know what is going on. You need to cut them a little bit of slack. <coughs> Granted, she would say, this isn't what, not how I would manage my servers, but you need to give your servers a little bit of slack. And she always tipped extremely well for servers. So, you just, I mean, you have to take in consideration their people, too. And they're trying their hardest, and we're not perfect either. There's very rare times that I don't tip well. We were at a restaurant in Lincoln not real long ago, and there was only three people in the restaurant eating, and those happened to be me and the two people we were having lunch with. And the guy, I was there, too. Yeah, the guy, <laughs> who, <laughs> the guy who sat us is really, really nice. Really nice. He was trained Poorly, he was well. Yes. He he owns and manages the restaurant though. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was I was gonna be okay with things until I didn't get certain things, and I realized well maybe he's you know there's times where I remember when I ran a restaurant when people would be late and you'd be serving and cooking. There's something to be said about that, and, and so I thought well maybe honestly he's probably <laughs> doing some of that, or maybe he's wrapping silverware, or maybe he's doing dishes. Yeah. And just out of a chance, I, I looked to the side and saw that he was on his phone at the host station. Chilling. <laughs> Chilling. Like a villain. Mm -hmm. And I heard them call our food, and I waited. They're ready for pickup. Ding, and I ding, waited. Ding. I heard them call our food again, and I waited. You're still waiting on your tea, aren't you? I'm still waiting on my yeah. hot tea. <laughs> Never got I tea. want you to know I was super frustrated. Uh, I still tipped him. Uh, I didn't tip him as well as I would have. I, I, but I always tip in the fact that I know traditionally in any state where their services, they are getting paid the bare minimum mm -hmm. to pay their taxes and everything else they earn at table side is, is theirs. theirs mm -hmm. Which is, and some people, well, that's their mm -hmm. choice. What they don't realize is the cooks that are cooking are getting paid a fair wage. The people who are doing the dishwashers are getting paid full. The hostess are getting paid. The managers are getting paid. And they have to paid very well. And they have to tip out all of those people before they leave. So they're making a dollar to an hour. They're being taxed ten percent on their sales. In some places it's it's between twelve and seventeen percent on their sales. Not what they have in their pocket, but on what the ticket sales and the register says automatically reported and 
they go home with the rest after they've tipped up the bus guy, after they've tipped up the dishwasher, the cook, the bear, whatever. And the only people not making above, at least a minimum wage, which in this state is $9, is the server. Yeah, they're the only ones that truly yeah. have to hustle. Yeah, them <clears throat> and the bartenders. Yeah. 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 I disagree with servers having a lower wage. I do too. I do too. I have actually done a lot of research and papers on that subject. And after talking with numerous people, after researching, I believe you can argue if you want. But when it comes down to it, I think everyone should be paid minimum wage and yeah. tipping should disappear. Well, and servers are some of the hardest working individuals in a restaurant. They deserve... I went to a restaurant in Louisiana, one of my favorite restaurants ever. If you ever go to New Orleans, go to Mother's, have the shrimp and oyster po' boy. You won't regret it. Have their iced tea. It's amazing. I would. <laughs> Don't, you can have the scallops. Oh, my gosh, the po' boys are, oh, my gosh, homemade bread. It's amazing. And they got these cookies. Anyway, they grass. They have signs everywhere. Nobody is to be tipped. And if a server accepts, they, they tell you when they sit down, we're not allowed to start, take tips. Please do not give me a tip. If a server takes a tip, they lose their job. They get paid really <clears throat> well. And I asked one of our servers, Dewan, he was just this great kid. He walked around singing jazz tunes when we waited on our table. And I said, would you prefer to be tipped? He's like, no. I work with everyone. We are equal here, and we all do the work, and it's awesome. But I also know that whether we have 5,000 people come through the door or we have 100 people come through the door, I have a paycheck. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the other thing, too, is if you're relying on your tips, that's a really hard life to live. Mm -hmm. Not knowing what your study paycheck is going to be every week. Am I going to be able to pay my bills? Am I going to be able to pay my rent, my car payment? And the reason you're not getting good tips <laughs> might be the, sh the chef's fault. Yeah. Right. If they're kicking out bad food, a lot of people take it out on the server, which is... It's terribly That's different. like yelling at the bank teller for giving you a late fee and yeah. for telling you there's no money in your account. Right. 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 Um, but if you bring it back to hospitality, it's a really, really unique area. I, like you were saying, we were talking about a career fair, it's how this all got started, but you were saying you don't think anyone really grows up thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to work in hospitality. Yeah, I, I taught for 19 years. Not once did I hear, I heard, I heard, Chef, and I heard someday I want to own a restaurant. Okay, because they wanted to cook. But they never, like, never that planning. No, I, I never heard anyone say they wanted to <laughs> manage a national park or a casino or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Dude, a national mm -hmm. park? Oh, that might be fun. I don't want to be a ranger, though. No, oh, yeah. Terribly fun. Which also, there is a like agricultural version of hospitality, running a park and stuff, which would be different. Yeah. And ecotourism, which is getting really, really big. I know really, really I know big. something about it. Eco and agrotourism. Mm -hmm. She wanted to run a park, so she was learning how to do that. Like Parks and Rec. I love that show. Love I that show. love that show, oh, too. Pawnee is Ron Pawnee. Swanson is my hero. Oh, my gosh. Leslie <laughs> Snopes. Nope. I'm, I'm having flashbacks to when they were in the grocery store and they were cooking, <laughs> they were cooking vegetarian bacon. And he said, would, sir, would you like to try some vegetarian bacon? He said, yes, I would. And he takes it and he throws it in the trash and they hand, he wants another piece and he keeps throwing the trash. <laughs> I've Just seen good. that video. Oh. They, they, uh, they did that one when they're talking about planning and He's Leslie's like, campaigning and she's trying to help everybody. And someone's like, what are you going to do about the big hole? There's this giant hole. She's like, we're going to build a park. And she doesn't realize that it's like, oh, gosh, just absolutely. I worked in starts. city planning. So before I came to the Leadership Center, I worked in Ferndale, Michigan, and I was the chamber director. But we did a ton of city planning and urban development. That show is their life. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I, did you, you always wanted to kind of be in hospitality, right, though? No. No, you wanted to be a journalist. Yeah. In high school, I wanted to be a journalist. And then I did a year, well, I did some gen eds my first year of college and then i did some really specifically journalism classes and then i realized that was not my career path <laughs> and so i and then i figured out pretty easily that what i wanted to do was event planning so i researched to make sure you and i'll have that option <laughs> and then i met with my advisor and we mapped out my next three years and 
I figured out the classes. The hard part about UNL, and um, I talked about this with Kiara last year, my intern, is that um, with the hospitality program, because there's so few teachers, the program is pretty small. Um, the classes are only offered in either the spring or the fall semester. You can't just kind of pick which one fits into <coughs> your schedule. You have to make sure your schedule fits with certain classes. And if you don't do that, then you have You're there to, a lot longer. Yeah, you're there a lot longer. So um, that's the really hard part that I disliked about the program. But I loved being in a small program as to being journalism is huge program at UNL. I mean, they're very critically acclaimed programs. So... I was very fortunate to enjoy a small program. I'm going to say that it's not going to be long before it's a critically acclaimed in their hotel management, though. It, they, they're putting out oh, great kids. In the and six great years that have been gone, they have it's made grown. strides in what they're doing. Well, and I'm completely jealous of the opportunities that they now get as students that I did not get. Well, I know when we met with Shannon and AJ, what has happened since last fall to this year is night and day. So it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. So, John, you were... In the Air Force for 17 years. Yes, that's correct. And, a firefighter. and I know you did a few things after, and you had said the world, was, the, the military doesn't necessarily prepare you for the civilian world. Oh, no, no. But more interesting, <laughs> why did you pick Le Cordon Bleu? Or did it pick you? No, no, no. I picked Chef. And it evolved into restaurant and hospitality management. Okay. But to back up, to be honest with you, on a psychological level, I used to save people's lives. I used to give people what they needed. I don't mean to sound dramatic, but that's it's true. true. Though. And that chapter of my life is over. My body can't do it anymore. My emotions have uh, reached my peak now. They're not as young as you used to be. Yep. You <laughs> you wake up and you're not 40 anymore. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the shocker. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about I was attracted to it because I like cooking. It had a I'm a guy. I like shiny things, you know. But I like products. I like products. I mean uh, habits with a finished product, a tangible finished product. Cooking. I love cooking, and uh, I realized that every human needs shelter, warmth, love, and food. Every human on the planet. Every being on the planet. And I'm like, well, I like doing food. I was given the tools to excel at that. I mean, everyone has to eat. There is no safer job on the planet than making food. Period. Well, I, yeah, I guess that's a yeah. good, healthy dose of perspective. That's a hundred percent. Everyone's got to well, eat. Well, you get three food. people in this room that are really glad that you you like food yeah. because we like eating your food. So, so yeah. far, so good. Absolutely. <laughs> and I kind of hit two on. Um, Love. People. Food makes people happy. Mm -hmm. What's at the center of every family gathering? 99% of the time it's food. Every Everything you... Every social event. That or a disagreement, every, which yeah. is usually solved by food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, there's a saying, the way to someone's heart is through their stomach, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. <clears throat> that's true. So, in, in retrospect, there's no safer job on the planet than making food. Now it's varying degrees, of course. You could be the guy that sells hot dogs at the hot dog stand on the on the corner. You're not going to be a millionaire. There's but no he's got a pretty dang secure job, I'm saying. Everyone's got to There's eat. There's nothing better than a steamed hot dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I can't eat them anymore, but... <laughs> Ballpark Franks? Yep. Shoot! Just the quote, and everyone's got to eat. Mm-hmm. Not everyone needs a mechanic. Not everyone needs a data analysis. Not everyone, you know, the list goes on. Everyone's got to eat. 100%. 100%. Dude, he just might have upped you on the hashtag wisdom right there. I'll just steal it. <laughs> steal it, yeah. Uh, Kurt, you were not raised in the hospitality industry. You were on a board that managed uh, a, a part of a hospitality industry because you were on the board of the Leadership Center. I just overtook him on the podcast as MC for a second. Sorry, I'll, I'll give it back in a bit. Uh, how have you enjoyed your journey in hospitality? I have. Um, it's not the first time I've been in the service industry. True. You had the beer backpack I job. I had the beer backpack at the Lincoln Stars games the first season which is where I learned I learned a ton 
about keeping people happy. Okay. So the phone's gonna die. Which um, is, yeah, low battery alert. But, but <laughs> really, have having that experience is probably the best one that had prepared me. We got ten percent redeemed. Okay. <laughs> that that prepared me for this the most, I think, actually. I mean, teaching, yeah. I mean, I've got communication skills, and you know, you can listen to people and try to figure out what they actually mean when they say certain things, which you know, people don't always ask for what they actually need. Yeah. They just kind of want to say something to you. They yep. don't know what they want. They don't. And yeah, sometimes they don't know what they want. Like if it's a dongle, they don't know what that is. <laughs> but Kurt <coughs> not only knows what it is, he knows how to say it. Right. Uh, but approaching this industry, I think it's you gotta, you got to want to uh, make people happy. You will be successful if you make people happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll be successful. and But you got to want to want to do that. Do. And some people don't want... Some people are fun haters. <laughs> you know who they are. Buzz kills. <laughs> They're buzz yeah. kills. They were <laughs> you know, and they, they could care less if people are happy. This is the wrong industry for those people. That's correct. Hmm. Yeah. So if you care about people being happy... You like to see people you, happy. Yeah, it's you a good industry. People in general. If you know yeah. how to make people happy, you'll be successful in that particular field of the hospitality industry. Mm. Because the hospitality industry, very plainly stated, is anything that you could get at your own house. Like we mentioned earlier, which is eating, food, sleeping, resting, exercising. Entertainment. 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 And if you're outside of your house and seeking those same things, that is technically part of the hospitality industry. Which is pretty much, I mean, a good portion of the world. Let's be. And it's what we do Mm -hmm. here. I think that is probably. Yeah, it's what we do here. We pride ourselves on taking care of people better than family. We really put tender loving care on what we do we cook for them we have beds we have places to commune and fellowship we have entertainment we have recreation and it's pretty incredible when you look at our team at the leadership center how that all came to be but the one common thread i think that goes throughout our entire team youngest to oldest uh beyond wanting a paycheck because i don't really think there's a ton of people here who just that, that are driven to come here by the paycheck. They probably need to evaluate their options if they are. The high school kids come here because of it, but they stay here for other reasons. Yeah, they totally stay. Well, yeah, they learn how to get paid once a month. I mean, it's a good lesson for them. But I sit there and think of just the fact that we all truly enjoy serving people. We truly enjoy making people happy. By and large and inherently, we are people pleasers that have made a career out of it and really... I think most days are very happy to do it. There, you know, there's times where it's hard. Sometimes it's infuriating, but I think of all the experiences I've had in this building, in particular, over the ten years I've been here, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But when I look at the jobs that prepared me for this, I mean, I worked at a conference center in Oregon. I swept hair in a salon. I organized files. I loved being a waitress. I absolutely loved being a bartender. My favorite job was being a barista. I just think, I mean, <clears throat> I used to sew hems and dresses. Like, it's just all things about making people happy and helping them have a great experience. It's some, and it's something you get to do. Like, it's kind of cool that we get to do that every day. And it's a, that's what makes it a little bit different than, per se, when we had classroom lines. And, um, or we were, you were a firefighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you were going to write stories. I mean, and and all those things, too, are things we get to do in our everyday life. So, in our work, which is cool, too. Well, it's a cool place. We've been here for 50 years, and we're looking forward to the next 50. Yeah! I don't know if I'll be here at the end of that 50. So, I mean, I mean. <sighs> got me. Only time will tell. Um, Only time will tell. Thank you for listening again to the Hospitality Authority Podcast. We really appreciate all nine of our subscribers. Uh, it's probably more by now. I yeah. Mean, if you're listening to this in like the year 2030, I'm sure we have well over 300,000 subscribers by now. At least 300. <laughs> <laughs> in, 2018, in 2018, we don't. Um, <laughs> on behalf of everyone here at the Leadership Center, um, 
Thanks for listening. This has been the Hospitality Authority Podcast from Leadership Center. We create moments that matter.